It wasn't the easiest for Ohio State and Indiana in the noon window on Saturday, but the Hoosiers and the Buckeyes both got the dub, and that's what matters. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. The Scarlet and Gray and the Crimson and Cream both overcame some challenges. They overcame some adversity, but I feel like Ohio State and Indiana feel very different about the said adversity and said challenges that both were over that both were able to overcome. Let's start first with the Indiana Hoosiers, a 31 to 17 win over the Washington Huskies. The big storyline coming into this matchup was Curtis Rourke not being able to go due to that thumb injury and Taven Jackson. Would this Indiana offense be the same? Would they able to be able to produce at that high level that they've been able to so far this season? And it was not the same offense, certainly. I think early in this game when I was watching Taven Jackson throw the football, I mean, he was just a little bit late, maybe a half a second late, and you know, maybe some of those reads just weren't as precise and as on time as they were with Curtis Rourke. Curtis Rourke is a very experienced quarterback. He's a very confident and very smart and a very cerebral quarterback. I think Taven Jackson, the performance that he had in this game, I think was a solid performance. And I think that this is a big performance for Taven for the development of him and the maturation of him as they look forward to Taven starting possibly in the 2025 season. But it was very clear early on that this was not going to be the same offense. Now, I want to give credit where credit is due. I want to give credit to the Washington Huskies because they played well defensively early on in this football game. I thought the Huskies covered well downfield, and that is a very tall task when you face this Indiana Hoosiers team. And I thought Washington played pretty solidly uh, against the run early in this game, put the emphasis on early because I think when Kurt Signetti and Mike Shanahan realized that This was not going to be your prototypical 300 yards and three touchdown type of performance that we've seen from Curtis Rourke this season. They said, we got to lean into this run game. And they leaned and they leaned and they leaned. And eventually Washington came tumbling down. This was an Indiana offense that averaged a 3.6 yards per carry on the entire afternoon. But Justice Ellison, 29 carries, 143 yards and a touchdown. They stuck with it. They stuck with it, they stuck with it, and then eventually some big runs really opened up. The run game opened up, and that was able to allow them to score in the second half and really extend that lead uh, throughout this football game. I've said this phrase on the channel many times before. I said it last year about Michigan. They can beat you any way they choose to beat you. It says something about this coaching staff. It says something about this team when they realize, hey, the throw game's not going to work today, maybe, and, and I say that, and even though I still think that there were throws that were able to be made throughout this game, but, you know, it isn't working like maybe that is up to our expectations, that is up to our standard and what we're used to when Curtis is the quarterback. So we got to get that run game going. We know that we are a very balanced offense, and that's what happened. They got that run game going, and eventually they were able to hit some big plays down the field in that run game. So credit to this offensive coaching staff for being able to adjust and overcome some adversity. Now, they were ahead by 10-plus points for a lot of this football game, right? So I want to emphasize some adversity, but this is a game that I think is going to show us a lot, and I think it's better for Indiana, this type of game, than maybe a 56-7 to blowout like we saw last week against the Nebraska Cornhuskers because as we now get into November, games are going to have a little bit more juice on them. Now that IU is undefeated, every team they play is going to be coming after them. You're going to be facing a lot of teams' best shots. So to be able to face some adversity, because they've been steamrolling, they've been boat racing a lot of their opponents, and they've been very impressive, and they haven't faced a ton of adversity this season. A lot of people have thrown out, hey, who have you played? Look at your schedule. But I think in this game, the way they were able to make plays down the stretch against Washington is going to help them where maybe everything wasn't absolutely perfect, and you had to adjust, and you had to make different plays both on offense 
and on the defensive side of the football. How about D'Angelo Pons? Two interceptions. They made key defensive stops at key points in the football game. So thumbs up to you, Indiana. I think that this game will go a long way into helping IU as we approach the month of November. Let's talk about the Nebraska Cornhuskers and the Ohio State Buckeyes. Mentality matters. And mentality is really where I want to start with this game because I think that's where I started my preview earlier in the week on this channel when talking about Nebraska and when talking about Ohio State. I thought Ohio State, hey, they had two weeks to think about that loss to the Oregon Ducks. They're going to come out. They're going to look to make a statement. They're going to come to look out focused. What was their mentality? I think that they were maybe peeking around the corner a little bit to that big matchup in Happy Valley next week against the Penn State Nittany Lions. What was going to be the Nebraska mentality in this game? Boy, they came out focused, and they came out with a big response. They looked refocused. They looked re-energized, and they looked recalibrated, specifically on the defensive side of the football. The Nebraska defensive line played a really, really good game. I think that this is the Nebraska that I think is the true Nebraska. Like Tony White said in his press conference this week in the lead up to the Ohio State game, he's like, we did some things that were not very smart schematically in that game against Indiana, and that's what really resulted that and many things what uh, ended up the result that it was in that 56-7 to drubbing against IU on the road last week. And I think they fixed some things schematically. It all started up front, like I just said, with the defensive line. Ty Robinson and Nash Hutmaker, uh, Jamari Butler, was able to do some things. Now, I think a reason why that defensive line was able to have the performance that they did is because Ohio State's offensive line, I think, is becoming more of a question and more of a question as the weeks kind of come on. Now, they were looking good earlier in the season, but of course, no Josh Simmons over at left tackle. He's out for the remainder of the season. And that's where I want to talk about Ohio State and their struggles in this game always came back to the offensive line. They had a replacement over there at left tackle, and he got beat, and he got beat often. There was a lot of pressure coming from the backside. But there was also pressure coming from up the middle. I talked about it in my preview that I saw it said, hey, I think Ohio State is going to do more things to capitalize on the advantage of their O line with McLaughlin and Jackson up front. But there was even pressure coming from up the middle. I think as a whole, this Ohio State offensive line remains a question. Okay, they struggled to pass block. They struggled to run block consistently, I should say, consistently uh, throughout this game. Okay. Ohio State, what do we say coming into the season? What have we said throughout this season? This is one of the best rushing attacks in all of college football, right? And you have one of the most dynamic um, run play callers in the country with Chip Kelly. But 64 yards rushing, 2.1 yards per carry at Ohio State? That is inexcusable. That cannot happen. I know Nebraska has a good front. I know they were re-energized. I know Tony White's a good coordinator. I know all of that. But if you're Ohio State and you have Trevion Henderson and you have Quinchon Judkins and you have Will Howard and you have Chip Kelly as a play caller, you got to find a way to, at the very least, scheme up some better running production than that. Okay? Like we talked about at the beginning of this that maybe Ohio State was looking ahead to Penn State. If this Ohio State offensive line plays like they did in this game against Nebraska, imagine what's going to happen on the road next week against the Penn State Nittany Lions. So they got to find a way to sure this up. Like, offensively, that's what all of my thoughts in this game, it all comes back to the offensive line for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Now, I want to give credit where credit is due. The Buckeye defense came up big in key spots. After the Malcolm Hartzog interception for Nebraska, they came up big at the goal line. They came up big keeping Nebraska off the scoreboard at that specific moment in time. Of course, the interception to seal it late. Like, Ohio State really leaned on their defense in this specific game, but that should be no surprise to anybody. This defense uh, certainly is one of the best, most talented in all of college football. Jim Knowles is a fantastic coordinator, and you're facing an offense that had not had a lot of confidence uh, in weeks past, certainly, and that's where I want to finish is with this Nebraska offense. Like, oh, they were not going to beat Ohio State going horizontal. 
They threw way too many screen passes. I know that's been something that Marcus Satterfield has had to, had to dial up at times. But, man, like when you face a team that has elite speed on defense like Ohio State, you're not going to beat them that way. Right, you're not going to beat them. You're not going to beat them like that way with perimeter blocking. You're not going to beat them that that way trying to get your speed against their speed. And look what happened when Dante Dowdell started to run the football better in the second half. Nebraska started to be better offensively. There were just some things throughout this game that just really scratched my head for Nebraska, where they just basically killed a minute off of the clock after that chaos, after the targeting penalty uh, as well, and then they got way behind the chains um, certainly as well. Look, Nebraska's defense did everything in their power to keep this a game, and they deserve a lot of credit, and the whole team with Matt Rule deserve a lot of credit for the way they came out and uh, coming off of a game like they had last week. But they got to figure something out with this offense. They got to figure something out, you know, for being in a position to possibly win this game and then finishing the way they did. And it really goes out to the first half as well, right? Playing horizontal. And then what you heard from the press conference that I played in the preview of this game with Marcus Satterfield earlier in the week, there's going to continue to be questions on offense for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Those are my thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts about these two games, Indiana and Ohio State come away with victories. And there's still certainly in the upper echelon of the Big Ten and threats to get to Indianapolis. I'm Big Ten Ted. We will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.